I don't know how many of you uh, caught the, um, the Bill Nye versus Ken Ham uh, evolution versus creation thing earlier this month um, in which a, a man of faith squared off against a man of science to try and determine once and for all whether uh, centuries of gradual advancement in human knowledge and years of painstaking scientific research could possibly trump a two naked people, a fruit of some kind, and a talking snake. Uh, it seemed like a fairly needless exercise to me. It would bug me about it, okay, two things bug me about it. One is that 90-something years after the Scopes monkey trial and 50-something years after Spencer Tracy told that guy on the witness stand to get a grip already, uh, this stuff is apparently still open to debate. Uh, the other thing is that when you set up a debate between creationism and evolution, you're implying that the two occupy the same space, that they're in the same realm of reality. And of course, creationism and evolution is, is nothing like that. Um, one is a matter of faith, and the other is a matter of scientific fact. I caught myself. I was gonna say scientific fact. And of course, as we all know, evolution is merely a theory, like gravity. Uh, but, but of course there was no way you were going to have a winner. I mean, you just, you don't win an argument against the talking snake. You just smile and go home and pour yourself a stiff one. But it's, it's troubling to me because you know, this is not about evolution versus creationism per se. It's about thinking. What the Nyham debate uh, indicated to me is something that I've, I've kind of noticed over the past 15 years or so especially, uh, you know, and, in, and in public life. The rise of what you might call a kind of a, a faith-based reality in which the principles and the mechanism of faith or belief is applied in public life, not just to spiritual and personal matters, but to everything, you know, economics, public policy, the environment, fuel efficiency, criminal justice, you name it. Of course, anybody can believe anything he or she wants to believe. But when those beliefs start to seep into public policy is when I begin to get a little bit of a problem. Um, the guy who is in charge of the state agency that oversees oil and gas drilling uh, is on record as saying that he believes that petroleum may be a renewable resource. <laughs> Despite the fact that 39 out of 40 published climate researchers say not only that global warming is real, but that humans are contributing to it, 37% of the American people believe global warming is a hoax. 13% of the American people voters anyway, believe that there is such an entity as the Antichrist and that his name is Barack Obama. Now, you may sense perhaps a, a partisan lean in my examples. That is neither my intent nor my fault. Petroleum is a finite resource. Global warming exists and the evidence that humans are contributing to it through, through greenhouse gas emissions is overwhelming. Barack Obama is a human. Uh, these are just facts. You know, and it's one thing to have faith, you know, and faith being traditionally defined as, you know, belief in something, belief in that which is unseen. But it's one thing to believe in the absence of evidence and entirely another to believe in the presence of a ton of evidence to the contrary. When you're doing that, you're not engaging in faith. You're engaging in delusion. I've been accused uh, at times of uh, wanting people to think exactly the way I do, and I don't. Um, I just would like for people to think. Uh, but it, it seems to me that, especially in, in recent years, a lot of the technological advances that have helped enable us to communicate have paradoxically also enabled us to dwell within our own customized realities with sources of information that ignore or outright dismiss facts, with social media that, that, uh, you know, that tend to 
strengthen our preconceptions or reinforce our preconceptions rather than disseminate information. And reality TV shows that, that dress up complete nonsense in real life's clothing. Um, and it's a problem because I, I think when, when you live in delusion and it becomes public, then you're kind of screwed. It's kind of like the culture to me seems to be engaged in this kind of creeping psychosis. And we'd better get the dosage right or we're, we're screwed and we may be there already. There's a thing, a, a term which you may have heard called a confirmation bias. Uh, and it's a, oh, we have fans, I guess. Uh, and, and it's a pretty simple concept. Um, and we're all guilty of it. It's just human nature. And it basically just means we all tend to take in information and filter it through our preconceptions. You know, and that's not always entirely a bad thing. Um, but, uh, but when writ large, it can be a problem. One example, a little more than a year ago, I, uh, I went to work for a small marketing firm in another city. And on the morning of the first day on the job, I walked in and I was given an assignment to, um, to edit a, uh, a, basically a blog post that the guy who was essentially the co-CEO of the company had written. And it was about uh, altering sales techniques, the idea that people have kind of grown skeptical of institutions, and so salespeople, in order to be effective, have to be or at least appear to be more genuine. Okay, you know, fair enough, valid enough, you know, point. So I start reading, and um, you know, he starts giving examples. It's like, you know, gosh, the 2008 financial crash really undermined people's faith in financial institutions, and Congress has this terribly low approval rating, and Barack Obama has the worst approval rating of any president in the history of the republic. He does? Wait a minute, that can't be right. And I wasn't sure, you know, but, but I thought, you know, this was late 2011, and at the time I thought, okay, I think his approval rating is in the 40s, which is not great, and it was. In fact, it was about 42, 43%, which is not great, but can't be the lowest ever. So, you know, I cast my mind back into the dim recesses of American history to think about who, what president might have had a lower approval rating than President Obama, and I, I was thinking, gee, I don't know, Rutherford B. Hayes with his Civil War beard, or, you know, Chester Allen Arthur with a dead rodent on his face, or, or William McKinley, perhaps, which explains why Leon Cholgosh, still my all-time favorite presidential assassin name, uh, shot him. But uh, it actually was none of these. It, uh, it actually was that guy, W. How you doing, W? Yeah, the like all going all the way back, you know. Uh, George W. Bush in the fall of 2008 had an approval rating of about 22, 23%, which is historically low. Uh, and I, I, you know, so I spoke up. I was like, excuse me, um, this thing you got here about Obama having the worst approval rating ever, it is not, strictly speaking, true. <laughs> um, and to his credit, the guy was like, oh, really? That's, that's not true? Okay, we'll go ahead and take it out. Take it out. But, uh, but I can show you the, the site on the internet where I found that. <sighs> I was sure he could. This did not make me feel better. And you will notice that I am back in Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> but, but it, you know, and this is not a dumb guy. Uh, this is a guy who was educated, very successful in his field. Uh, but so strong was his confirmation bias, he was a hardcore Republican too. Uh, and you know, he told me as much before I even started reading, so my antenna were up. But uh, so strong was his confirmation bias that, that he just wrote that and was gonna go with it. And that would have seen publication if I had not backstopped him. Uh, but again, it, it shows how strong confirmation bias can be and how the web, in particular, can be such an enabler of it. I mean, the web is really kind of like a reality buffet, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you Google long and hard enough, you're gonna be able to find whatever you wanna see, like this thing from, you know, obamasucks.org or wherever you got it from. Uh, 
but that's, that's the power of that. And that leads us to another phenomenon uh, called the bubble. Uh, except for some people, uh, I, I think it's more like a bathosphere. You know, bathosphere, it's like that thing made of like three foot thick steel and it's got a window about this big and, and people take it to the bottom of the ocean to hunt for the mega squid. You know, that thing that nothing penetrates. Uh, it's, it's distressing for me because, you know, I've worked almost my entire career as a journalist. Now, journalism is flawed. I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, they, they traditionally call journalism the first draft of history. And first drafts contain mistakes and they need revision. Um, but there's a, an idea at the heart of it. And the idea is that if you present fairly accurate information to the people, they can use that information to inform the decisions that they make, particularly in the public sphere, and particularly at election time. But the more, I, the more time I spent in the field, and really it was a specific time around the mid to late 1990s, I started to run into something weird. Um, I was used to encountering people who were uninformed. But it was around that time that I started to encounter people who were not just uninformed, but misinformed. People who believed stuff that was not just verifiably untrue, but was just nuts. <laughs> and, and it gobsmacked me. Um, for example, not too long after Hurricane Katrina, uh, which was kind of a big deal to me because I'm originally from New Orleans, uh, I was in a cab. And uh, the cabbie was asked, you know, naturally we were talking about Katrina, about a week after. And he was talking, and he seemed very excited about this theory um, that he had heard somewhere, that, uh, that the government had deliberately undermined the levees in New Orleans because they had found a large reservoir of oil underneath the city, and they wanted to clear this was an African-American gentleman. They wanted to clear black neighborhoods of all the houses so they could move in and begin drilling. Now, you need to think about this for, I don't know, about a second and a half before realizing that this is really pretty ridiculous, isn't it? I and mean, it, it seems like an awful, I mean, we're talking about people who, generally speaking, could screw up a ham sandwich. And, and we're talking about an amazing amount of coordination to say, you know, oh, that's the, we found oil under New Orleans, wonderful. Here's what we'll do. We will undermine the levees to the point at which they won't break immediately, but will in the event of a storm that's this strong and comes this far in, and that way it'll come in and kill 1,800 people, but that's okay to make an omelet and you need to break eggs, and I, my head hurts. Uh, and, and it was just, it was just bizarre. And I started thinking, besides the nonsensical nature of this thing, what is it about a conspiracy theory that fills an emotional void in somebody? Like, why is it so difficult? And why put all that time and energy in even entertaining that sort of thing, rather than accept, accepting the simpler and infinitely more believable premise that the levees collapsed because the Army Corps of Engineers did a crap job on? And, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. Really, the, the only thing that I can think is that perhaps it's comforting to some people to, to believe that somebody is orchestrating the awful things that happen rather than, you know, it's, it's entirely a matter of chance or, or negligence and that life is actually a good bit more random and arbitrary than we'd, than we'd like to believe. But, uh, but anyway, that's the, the power of the conspiracy theory. And you see it all the time now. You know, the 9-11 the, the truthers, the birthers, the people who believe that, that the, the, Boston bomb, the Boston Marathon bombing was a false flag operation or something like that. The folks who, who construct these elaborate Rube, Rube Goldberg contraptions in their heads to explain why the chicken crossed the road. When everybody knows why the chicken crossed the road, it was to distract people from Benghazi. Uh, but seriously, it, it, it comes down to, to an even deeper problem. Uh, when conspiracy theories take hold, uh, and they can, it, it leads to all sorts of bizarre things. There was a, a national poll conducted last year 
in which 4% um, uh, of um, American registered voters say they believe lizard people control our societies by gaining political power. There are about 146 million registered voters in the United States. 4% of that is a, a hair under 6 million. <laughs> These people are registered to vote. And, and this is when I really began to, to get a sense of the problem. There was a, a, another a study a few years ago that kind of gobsmacked me. It was a study from some guy from the University of Michigan. And a nutshell, <sighs> What they did was, was determine people's knowledge, what they thought was knowledge, and then try to correct it with new or, or confirmed information. And what they found is that a pretty healthy uh, percentage of the people that they studied, when confronted with the new information, instead of adjusting their thinking to accommodate it, would actually dig in deeper to what they already thought. And they called this, the researchers did, the backlash effect. Uh, and this was something where I, I really almost just kind of threw up my hands. Like, like what, okay, you know, somebody like me, uh, you know, who, who sees the, the inherent value of providing information for people, you know, if people are just gonna, uh, if folks are just gonna dig in with the lizard people, what's the point? What am I doing? And, and honestly, I wish I could answer that. Uh, there's, there's some hope. Uh, you know, the, the same folks who did that study came back and said, well, you know, given enough time and given some persistence, if people were, are presented with new information in a non-threatening way, over time, people's attitudes can change. Certainly, my own experience, uh, personal experience uh, is a big factor in getting people to change their minds. But, uh, but ultimately, what to do and can it be accomplished through you know, journalistic means. I don't think so. I don't know. But what I do know is this. We gotta think. I mean, we just, we gotta think critically. And really when we think critically, all we're, we're saying is think. Because, <laughs> because when, when we're basing public policy and public decisions on nonsense, you know, we, we end up like, you know, the you know, Charlotte traffic last week in the snowstorm, you know? It's like everybody's sealed in their own little container, their own little sealed containers, half blind, facing every conceivable direction, you know? Everybody's stuck in place, spinning their wheels, and it's a giant, unmanageable mess. When we base our public policy on the facts that are known, imperfect or incomplete though they may be, it's more like Charlotte traffic on a normal day. Uh, still a mess, <laughs> but a more manageable and, and, you know, and, and solvable mess that, you know, that at least we can, you know, we can all be sort of faced in the same direction. Because, to paraphrase Daniel Patrick Moynihan, we can have our own opinions on the facts, but we can't have our own facts. You know, when we're all headed in the same direction, you know, at the very least, we can all get home safely, unless, of course, the lizard people jack us on the way. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>